Hi, welcome to episode two of Metastatic Modernity. The video topic for today is cosmology, which relates to my professional career. And we're going to start with the Big Bang, which happened 13.8 billion years ago. And this is the event that created space and time. That's a little hard to get your head around because we normally think of something exploding into a pre-existing space, but that's not really the way it works here. A good way to get your head around it is to think of a balloon that you're inflating and maybe you put some glitter specks on the balloon to represent galaxies. As you blow up the balloon, the glitter specks get farther apart. They're not expanding themselves, um, but the space in between them is. And when the balloon was tiny, tiny, if we could imagine it going all the way down, all the space was just in some tiny little uh, nugget. The other maybe somewhat similar but useful analogy is um, bread baking in an oven with raisins in it representing galaxies getting farther apart. And there's no oven analog in the universe that it's expanding into. That's just part of our limited um, way of, of uh, comprehending the world. But um, all of the space is the bread. The whole bread is the space. And you can imagine it starting out from something tiny. And when it was tiny, it was very hot, so hot that atoms couldn't really exist. They basically boiled away. And um, you just had quarks and gluons that eventually got cool enough to make nuclei and then atoms and then dust and planets and stars and galaxies all sort of attracted by gravity so that at this point we have a bunch of galaxies in the universe and basically everything in this uh, image is a galaxy except for a star that's sort of at uh, lower right along the bottom edge sort of right uh, right there so um, we have all, the, all these galaxies and our sun is just one star in the galaxy our sun and solar system is about a third the age of the universe, four and a half billion years old. Um, if you went out and looked at the night sky, estimates vary of how many stars are visible, some say 6,000, but that requires a really dark sky and excellent vision. If you can only see to, in fact, uh, at magnitude 5.2, that's 2,000 stars, and it's a challenge to see a 5.2 magnitude star that's fairly dim. I challenge you to go try to look. Um, so that's about 2,000 stars. And of those 2,000 stars that we can see in the sky, only 15 are intrinsically dimmer than the sun. So our sun is no superstar. Um, let's take the sun as something like a chickpea in size. So I've got this um, math ruler. Don't you wish you had a math ruler? It's got inches and centimeters. And here's a chickpea. It's about a centimeter. Don't you wish you had a chickpea? Um, so we got the chickpea sun, and here is a human hair on a piece of tape representing the size of the earth. Um, now, earth isn't shaped like a hair, but it would be the same diameter as this hair, so it's pretty small. And I would have to pull the earth back about a meter to get the right um, earth-sun distance. Now, Jupiter on this scale is like a sand grain. It's a millimeter. And I would have to put the sand grain back, uh, you know, five meters, which I'm not going to be able to do. And there's the sun. Um, but the whole solar system would require something like a football field to accommodate. And I'm, I don't care what, how you define the word football uh, internationally. Uh, it's, it's roughly that size. Meanwhile, the next star, next chickpea is, I'm, I'm by the way, doing this in uh, non-mirrored, which is very unintuitive. Uh, that's the only way you could actually read math ruler. So you get to see me struggle with uh, coordination. But you've got two, um, see, there we go. It's really hard. Try it. Um, you got two chickpeas that have to be about 300 kilometers apart um, to represent the distance between stars and our galaxy. And a galaxy is a tight collection of stars. It's a swarm. And even there, it's almost unimaginably uh, empty. So our solar system itself is pretty empty. I mean, by the time you have Jupiter and the sun, you've got 99.95% of the mass. I'm not making up that number. 99.95% of the mass, and the rest is those tinier crumbs and specks of dust. And that's on a football field, and it's almost completely empty. Almost nothing else. Uh, it's just empty space. And then the galaxy is even uh, more empty. Um, and a galaxy is a tight collection, but so empty are galaxies that 
even if you have two galaxies of say 100 billion stars that collide and move through each other, the stars are so far apart that they, that they can pass right through each other and no stars hit, no stars collide. The gas and dust will, but the stars themselves are such tiny little pinpricks that they pass right through and it's, it's, uh, it's basically empty. Um, now, part of the reason we're going through all of this is to give a sense of scale and also a sense of insignificance. The Copernican revolution was really important in shaping our, our views and shaking our foundations of how important we thought we were uh, up to that point, and we're still continuing that journey. So the first one was that the Earth is no longer the center of the universe or the solar system. It's just this little dust moat. I mean, it's a tiny thing around our sun. But then the sun is not special in our galaxy. It's not at the center. It's not uh, among the brighter ones. It's uh, one of 100 billion. Um, then the Milky Way itself, our galaxy, nothing special about it. It's not at the center. It's um, one of 100 billion in the visible universe. Now, let me stop for a second and say what I mean by visible universe. So the universe is only 13.8 billion years old, which means that light has only had so much time to travel and has only been able to travel 13.8 billion light years. So that's as far as we can see when we look back in our telescopes. Um, that doesn't mean that that's all there is. Just like, um, so if, if we went to the edge of the, what's now the visible universe to that edge, we'd see more universe beyond it. Just like if you're swimming in a lake or ocean or scuba diving, um, you can only see so far in the water, but that doesn't mean that that's all the ocean there is. If you swam to the limit of what you could see, you would see more things beyond it. You're pretty confident in that. Uh, or the surface of the earth. You can only see out to the horizon, but with, if you walk to the horizon, there's more out there. The universe is the same way. We have a horizon limited by light travel time. How big is it? We know from cosmic microwave background uh, measurements that the geometry of the universe is very close to flat, within 1%, which implies that if it is curved back onto itself or something, that scale would be at least 100 times bigger than what we can see. So that's a linear dimension. The volume would be at least a million times bigger than the tiny patch of the universe we get to see. So there's the next Copernican revolution is that the visible universe is only a tiny fraction of the entire space in our universe. And for the final kicker, our universe likely isn't the only universe. Um, if you can create one, you can probably create more. If one can come into existence, what would stop others? One is a very odd number. If you find one of anything, there's likely another sand grain, a chickpea, star, a galaxy, and a universe. And, you know, inflation theory and cosmology and string theory are supportive of this idea that multiple possibilities can, uh, can come into existence. So the point of going through all this is that it's not about us. This universe isn't here for us. We're insignificant or an insignificant speck around an insignificant sun and an insignificant galaxy and in an insignificant sector of our universe and maybe an insignificant universe. And so um, that I think is an important perspective and that's what I really wanted to share. So um, I hope you enjoyed this. Stick around for the next um, episode that will come out soon. Um, episode three on the early life on our planet. In the meantime, I encourage you to check out the Do The Math blog which has some supplementary information relating to this series, then until next time.